Bob Weller uh, on Facebook. On Facebook. Um, I had guided 20 years from the mid 90s till about 2014 full time out of Portland's brand in Bokelia. And um, uh, could see the decrease from year to year. And by the end of, uh, before the turn of the century, millennium, I made a couple trips up to Moat Marine and got some information from them on how they were doing things and um, what they're, where they were stocking and it wasn't here. But when you have a tower boat, you can actually see in the water. It's not what you catch, but you can actually see what's going on. So a little bit of background about me. Uh, we are a 501c3 non-for-profit. Each and every one of our board members and directors has stepped up and we have all put our own personal money into this. We do not get paid, we will never get paid. We are doing this for the children. Our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. We have a wonderful business plan and uh, a board of directors, a, a advisory board, it goes on and on. This will be done and it will probably be uh, funded before this fall. Our goal is to have the tanks and everything that we need before the Fort Myers, Fort Myers boat show. So we can have a booth there and tell people what's going on. Um, everybody says this can't be done. Don't rely on the Florida legislature to do anything about anything. That's why we do this privately. It's not gonna happen. And um, we're gonna start out here just with a slide presentation. Um, and I think it's going to answer a lot of your questions, and then we'll take your questions. And um, we don't sugarcoat anything. We're going to tell you exactly how we feel. We don't know the answer. We will tell you we don't know the answer. But um, we've done a lot, a lot of research on this. All right, so um, our mission statement is to provide a clear path to enhance the Florida fish stocks for future generations while concurrently strengthening the economy. And the reason we put the economy in is because in our fundraising, we have three stages. Okay, our first stage is just getting members. Um, on our Facebook group page, uh, Restock Florida Fisheries Now, we have over 3,600 members in nine weeks. Okay, people are now starting to get to know us, but again, they don't know us. And that's, we're hoping that everybody else will do that. So our Facebook group will be writing this down as Restock Florida Fisheries Now. Our web page, which is the page you should really go to, is, it's all one word, floridarestock.org. Florida Restock. We have a card to have that. Yeah, and we'll be handing out those. Floridarestock.org. So phase one is getting people involved. We have a GoFundMe page up, trying to get some money in there. Phase two, once we get a little more established, is the business community. And then phase three will be you know, your, your large uh, boats, companies, tackle manufacturers, um, people like that. Um, go ahead, please. Okay, as I said, we're a 501c3 non-for-profit. Go ahead. So, I came up with this idea. We, this is probably in the back of your mind, you got all your questions going on. Please remember just this right here. This is going to really answer a lot of questions. We are a piece of the jigsaw puzzle. You can't see the picture because we're just a piece. But being that piece, we have all the other pieces out there that actually connect. And when they connect, there's actually a picture. We've got, you know, all the other pieces include anything you want to talk about. Ecology, clean the water, let's replant the seagrass, let's do something with the coral. Save the manatee. Everything are all pieces. We're all connected. The problem that we have is we've got 27 different groups going everywhere, and nothing's getting done anywhere. So that's why we're, we decided to do it ourselves. Okay? So we're just a piece of the puzzle. Our main focus is putting fish in the water. But again, we need every other piece of the puzzle to make, to make that happen for in the long haul. Okay, we need water clean, we need seagrass restoration, all that stuff, okay? We're a piece, okay? We're not against anybody, and hopefully they're not against us, because they're a piece of the puzzle too, whether they know it or not. 
And when you see some of the pieces that we're going to be talking about down the road, as you know, not a great picture, but um, from uh, <coughs> south of us uh, down to Marco and north, uh, the big three fish are closed for the first time ever. Um, snook, redfish, and trout. What people don't realize is that, I remember back in the 70s, we had a monster freeze down here, killed over a million snook and a lot of redfish. And if we had fish hatcheries with the babies already there, we could have had the restocking. So you have to ask yourself a question. Do you want to be proactive or do you want to be reactive? If you're proactive and you have these fish hatcheries up and running, you have stock to replenish when a catastrophe happens or if stocks get low. Think about it. So when you think of a fish hatchery, I lived in Texas in the 70s and 80s as a teacher, biology teacher, by the way, and a history teacher, a coach, all that good stuff. So we had a big freeze in Texas in about 83. The temperature went to 17 degrees for three nights. It was so cold that palm trees froze solid and all died. We had an inch of ice and the salt water in the back country. Everything died. When I say everything, even the grass. It all died. The <coughs> stuff that left will live to the stuff made it to the Houston ship channels or back out into the Gulf. So Florida, along with CCA and some other organizations, got together. We built this massive fish hatchery, about $15 million. And uh, this is what people think of what a fish hatchery is. 50 acres. This one alone produces 25 million fingerlings annually. It's basically three fish. Redfish, spotted sea trout, and flounder. They stock more flounder, which is the least amount they stock, 1.5 million fish annually. The entire state of Florida has stocked totally, cumulatively, for the last 20 years in, red, in redfish. They stock more flounder than we've stocked in redfish in 20 years. We only have two uh, redfish hatcheries. They're very small. There's the one up in Port Manatee with Moat, and there's the one in Crystal River, which is an 8,000 square foot facility above ground tanks. We'll be talking about that. We don't want to build that, okay? We want to build that. These are above ground tanks. They work exactly like your aquarium does at home. They do not take the old water out and new water in. They recycle and filter the water. You watch your ammonia levels, your pH levels, salt levels, temperature. And I wasn't sold on the idea until we talked to Bob Wozno. Bob Wozno is from Florida Gulf Coast University. He did start Project Red Start many years ago, but he is in charge of 80 to 120 marine biologist students. And he's in charge of what's called the Vester, V E S T E R. Vester Marine Laboratory and Research Center in Bonita Springs. Without Bob, I doubt if I would be involved with this. He is the nucleus behind this. He will give us all the information that we possibly need. And those students, by the way, need hundreds and hundreds of hours of um, in the field. And guess where they'll be helping out in person? Okay? So above ground fish hatcheries. That one that you're looking at, this is a tank, just about this big, about four foot high, will be able to um, produce, we're just talking redfish here, about 5,000 fingerling sized redfish in about five months, okay? So let's talk the difference between a, red, a, a fingerling and a fry. A fry is your little small ones, okay? One, two inches. We call those bait, because when you dump them in the tubes, that's what they become. Their survival rate, is less than one tenth of one percent. Fingerlings, seven to ten inch fish, which redfish in a correct environment, a lot of food, not have to travel around, right temperature, grow very rapidly. We give them seven to ten inches in about five months, and their survival rate in the wild is anywhere between four to seventeen percent. We are going to make that way up. Now, how are we going to do that? When they get to those seven to ten inch ranges. We are going to put them in a bunch of flats boats, and we are going to take them to all these destinations, way in the back country, back in the mangroves, where there's not too many predators, and all these different spots. Because redfish, once they're about 14 inches, they will stay within a mile and a half of 
where that is before they become sexually mature and go out to the Gulf. So a little knowledge on redfish. Every redfish that you've ever caught inshore is, an, is a, um, a pre-adolescent. It doesn't have eggs. It's not sexually mature. Okay? You probably haven't caught a redfish under 12 inches or have netted one because they don't live in the estuaries. So what a redfish does is when a redfish becomes, let's say 32 inches or above, somewhere in that area, it will leave the estuary, it has reached puberty, it wants to reproduce. It's gonna go out to the Gulf. It's gonna go on uh, some type of structure or reef out there you know, from a mile to eight, 10 miles out. And that's where it's gonna live its life. We have 60 pound redfish here on our coast. You, the only time you ever catch them is incidentally if you're fishing in deep water, because that's where they live, okay? That's where they breed. And then when the babies, they're made out there, become 10, 12, 15 inches, let's say it's 12 or more, then you'll see the rat reds show up and in short. And that's why you haven't caught them. So when they become sexually mature, three, four years old, they leave the estuaries, they become uh, mature spawning fish. Problem we have with redfish, even our snook population is still fairly good condition. The redfish population and the snook population usually breed offshore. The ones you see on the beach guys are not the big breeders, by the way. Those are offshore fish, <laughs> snook and redfish. Um, Bob Wazno and the marine biologist at Bester, FGCU, went out and they do oxygen monitoring of, with scuba gear on. They went out 33 miles during the red tide and blue green algae. Okay, 33 miles, and they went out to all these you know, artificial reefs, and guess what the oxygen level was? It was zero. Complete kill zone. On the bottom, you got everything dead, laid up, crabs, you name it. Nothing. So people are saying, oh, don't worry, you know, the fish will come back, we told you. No, they didn't come back, they migrated from somewhere else, okay? And our whole brood stock, our redfish, was wiped out. And that's why there's still some snook around. Those were the ones that didn't go out in the Gulf, they stayed in the rivers and stuff like that. So we have to, re we have to help mother nature out right now, okay? It's not coming back. Bob Wozno is telling us Pine Island Sound and the Sterile Bay is officially a dead zone. There's not enough brood stock for this to come back. So if you think it's gonna happen, it's not, okay? Not unless we do something. I'm going on a little bit more than normal, sorry.